I am here today with uh, Adam Katz, a.k.a. Dennis Bouvard. Now, I have you credited as the author of a book we had covered previously on the show, Anthropomorphics. And I tried to search a bit more for any other you know, uh, qualification or anything you had, you're a difficult find, a difficult guy to find online. So I was also wondering, aside from that, if there was anything else that you would like to attach to your name or any other certifications or anything. Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a, a college instructor and there's nothing all that uh, special about that. But, uh, um, I just will point out that, that I've written a lot about GA in Anthropoetics, which is the, uh, kind of the official, um, generative Anthropology Journal run by Eric Gans. And, and if you go on, on his website, um, on, on his website, you'll see, a, you know, a, a link to Anthropoetics, which has been publishing now since 1995. And I think I published my first uh, um, essay there probably 2000, 2000 or 2001, I don't remember. And I've got, I don't know, I, I'd say at least, uh, at least a dozen or so essays published there since, uh, since then. And so that's, you know, that, that, that's a place if you're interested in, uh, in, in the work I've been doing, that's, that's certainly a good place to go. And, uh, you know, of course I'm on Twitter as, as un, under Dennis Bovard and, uh, um, and of course I've got the Substack. Um, yes, the, the Substack, which is dennisbouvard.substack.com. It's known as the GA newsletter. I've got, I actually have quite a few things uh, pulled up here. I find it very interesting. But if anyone wants more information on any of the topics covered, check out Anthropoetics. It's a fun site, too, if you're like me and you kind of like old internet uh, aesthetics. Uh, it very much looks like a, a serious <laughs> academic journal. And uh, the GA newsletter is you update pretty regularly too. I find there's there's pretty substantive stuff on here. Yeah, every ten days or more or less, I I, I suppose I, I post something. And of course, I was blogging on the GA blog, which is also on the Anthropoetics website, um, also for like you know more than ten years. Um, and then I, I moved over to Substack uh, um, at the end of two thousand. So, you know, so there's plenty of stuff going back there as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of material. A lot of that one ended up going into the book, but not all of it by any means. And that's what's so interesting about it. It's quite a, a deep field of research. And uh, with anthropomorphics, we touch on the originary theory. And I believe it was pioneered by an Eric Gans. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yes, and so I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, I was going to say I was going to leave it to you because it is it's a very fascinating theory. And once we covered anthropomorphics on the show, I had never been introduced to this theory before. And some would say it's a bit of a controversial theory, and we can get to that later. But I found that the heart of the originary theory was a what we would call a paradigm shifting idea. And for those of the listeners on the show, this kind of ties into when we covered the uh, structure of scientific revolutions about, you know, paradigm being a very distinct worldview. So what I found with anthropomorphics and the originary theory is it gave me space to look at things in a very different way. And I really liked that. And I was hoping that you, and I'm sure you've done this a hundred times, but just to reiterate in, in the best, in, for the layperson, for someone like me, a handsome idiot, if you could very easily summarize the originary theory and what made it such an attractive uh, theory to yourself. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I, I've done I've done this many times, but uh, but but I, I I don't get tired of it, and I think that's that's even part of uh, the originary hypothesis is the more is more the way we talk about it. Um, uh, I think that it's part of it that, that there's a kind of inexhaustibility to it, so that I don't really get tired of, uh, of of going back to basics and going back to the to the beginning, to the origin of it. Um, and yes, speaking about it in terms of of a paradigm shift is uh, is a good one, um, and and it kind of follows up on what we could see as Rene Girard's um, paradigm shift uh, with the introduction of mimesis as as fundamental to the constitution of the human. And, uh, you know, Girard, who of course was a, a teacher of, uh, of Gans, um, he, um, first of all, through, you know, through literary study and through certain, through, uh, certain novelists, um, came to the conclusion that, um, that desire is, um, is inherently mimetic. We want what we want because we see others wanting it. And 
Um, the first the first paradigm shift, uh, since, since you've introduced that term, it's a helpful way to think about it. The first thing that Girard really attacked is, is, is what he called the romantic lie. Um, and the romantic lie, which, um, you know, you can tie to the actual romantic uh, romantic movement starting in the in, in the early 19th century, um, uh, although a lot of the the you know the, the the better romantic poets and writers were were, were, were kind of aware of of, of this issue uh, at least uh, at least uh, implicitly, uh, but the romantic lie is that, is that um, our desires originate within ourselves, right? Within our own kind of authentic deep selves. Right, and, uh, um, and this is a very common and and almost the common sense way of thinking about your desires. That you know, what could be more yours than your desires, right? Whether it's desire for you know, um, uh, well, food, but but uh, you know, for art, for entertainment, uh, for friends, for for lovers, whatever it might be, right? If these if these desires aren't your own, then then what is your own, and who are you? And, uh, and and this was you know this was your odd starting point to say yeah it's not your own, right? We desire because we're um, because we're mimetic beings and and again this is this is you know makes perfect sense as well. I mean you don't have to um, you, you, you I don't think it takes a lot of convincing to to, to emphasize how important imitation is in our lives. Um, you have to you know all you have to do is watch a, a small child for about ten minutes, and you could see how you know how how imitation suffuses and, and and pervades everything that we do and all of our thinking and we're always you know we're always in in this space what's someone else doing what is someone else thinking about what we're doing and and so on are, are we are we being accepted by others um which is also kind of a mimetic question and uh and so gerard kind of followed up on this 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 insight itself obviously goes back to you know at least to, to aristotle if we're talking about Western thought, um, who, who also obviously foregrounded my Mises as extremely important, uh, but Girard took it a step further to point out that implicit in mimetic desire is mimetic rivalry. If you want what others want, then at a certain point, you're going to want exactly the same thing as another wants, and it's going to be something that you both can't have. Uh, and in fact, that enhances the desire. It intensifies the desire that you both can't have it. Um, only one of you can have it, right? That increases the value of the object of desire. And so, and, and so, how does this get resolved? For for Girard, um, he hypothesized uh, uh, what what he called the scapegoat mechanism, right? He, he imagines, you know, a group of Again, this is also kind of not as explicitly as Gans, but it's kind of a, a hypothesis about where humans, how humans became humans, um, and uh, what the, the way he thinks about it is is um, in within a group where this tension and this mimetic rivalry is increasing to the point where it's becoming a crisis, the 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 group singles out one single member. Of the group for whatever reason it could be something completely arbitrary that just you know for the moment distinguishes that person and they all turn against that person and in that way they overcome their mimetic rivalry by attaining a kind of unanimity towards this one figure who then basically gets killed right it's uh you know it, it, it's it's a lynching scene yeah, and you had pointed out in the book um, at various points that you know by once we codify this desire, it automatically creates this negative space. Like if you want something, you start forming this "thou shalt not" almost just by necessity. You know, you create this negative space. So once you desire like what I want and who we want to be, by that very nature, you have to conceptualize of who you don't want to be. Otherwise, you know, nothing exists in that sense. Uh, well, yes, and but but that comes earlier for Girard than than, than for Gans. Although we might be speaking about somewhat different things, we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, because um, for, uh, for what 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 so that's a paradigm shift right away, right? To see and then and then for Girard that that became a way of of inquiring into religions. This this I think is what got him interested in religions, and he started finding these scapegoating rituals everywhere. Right, and he started. You know, this became his explanation for mythology, um, and and ultimately, 
uh, he, he turned to, to Christianity because his reading of the Gospels was as was to see Jesus, in a sense, um, uh, allowing himself to, to, to be scapegoated precisely in order to discredit scapegoating precisely because Jesus does nothing wrong. Um, hmm, and just ask everyone and just asks everyone to, to love each other. And, and that's precisely the thing that makes him the target of everybody. Um, and, and so for, for, for Girard, once, once we have this, this example of, of Jesus as the obviously innocent scapegoat, we can no longer carry out these scapegoating rituals in good faith. Okay. And so that's kind of, in a sense, the end point, um, for, for Girard. So, um, so, so again, that's a paradigm shift. Now, now Gans, um, uh, raises the question that of, of um, well, okay, let's say we, we accept that that this group of, let's say, you know, proto-humans, advanced hominids, whatever, whatever we want to call them, do single out some member of the group and, 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 and just kill them, you still have the problem of why that would change anything, why, why that would mean something to them, right? So for Girard, this has to introduce some, some sense of... Um, uh, whether it's whether whether it's I don't know some sense of regret or some sense of of uh, of of guilt or something that that causes them to reflect in some way, but the problem is they don't have the means of doing that. I mean, all of that all of that already assumes that you have language that allows you to reflect and 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 to and to feel guilty and 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 to ask why you did this and and so on. And th there aren't the means to 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 do that. And and so um, so so Gens kind of approach this from the standpoint of, well, you, you, you know, you need language. Language has to come out of this um, in, in, in some way. Uh, and so the first thing that he did is, is, is he just introduced the, the, the notion that after the scapegoating scene, um, everybody points to the, the corpse, right? Um, and and, and this, this pointing is, is, is the first sign. But then if, if what's meaningful is the pointing itself, then you don't need the actual victim. You just need the mimetic rivalry and you need the mimetic crisis and you need a sign that averts the mimetic crisis. And, and, uh, and if you think in terms of averting the crisis, then it works better in terms of recognizing the crisis after the fact. Because again, why, why, why after the fact, why would they point after they, after, after they kill the corpse? Again, we'd still have the same problem of why, um, of why this was meaningful animals kill members of their group this this you know this happens and it doesn't change them in any way right so why would it change even an especially intelligent advanced form of hominid so um so you need the sign so 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 how do you get to the sign so then gans kind of thought in terms of of a scene and and the scene to some extent starts with with something similar to uh to girard's scene where there's some object that that all of the um, uh, that 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 all of the members of the group desire, and and he keeps it more in a sense down to earth than uh, um, than Gerard, I think, because because Gans just assumes it's it's something some food object to kill, right? That they brought in, you know, a woolly mammoth or um, or a deer or you know whatever right, you know whatever, right. whatever you imagine them, you know, you know, being ready to eat. And, you know, so the way in which animals, including very intelligent and advanced animals like apes, approach their, approach their food is, is through the, the ranking system, right? There's alpha, beta, and, and, and so on. They go through it, right? And, 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 uh, um, and, and in a sense, that's how order is maintained. Um, so what, what Gans assumes is, is that you have this intensification of mimetic desire. Each sees the other wanting this central object. And... Um, as they both, as, as they're all sort of approaching it, their desire for it intensifies, and the rivalry for it intensifies as well. And this overrides the animal ranking system, right? Because because the thing about the alpha is is he's only the alpha in relation to one beta, right? Animals don't like, gang up in the same way, right? At least not 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 kind of deliberately. Right, so so the beta might challenge the alpha, but the alpha will beat him down, or the beta will will defeat the alpha, and then he's the alpha, right? So that that's the way things work with animals. But in in the in the scene that 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 Gans is imagining here, this all gets overridden because everybody's just kind of rushing towards the central object at the at the same time, 
And this creates this new possibility of, of, of the kind of conflict that Girard did have in mind as well, right? Of kind of, you know, everyone attacking everyone else in some whatever vague way that, that would appear as everyone's kind of terrified at this new scenario. And, and so Gans says that, that what happens is, you know, if you think about everyone reaching for the object, all you then have to imagine is the, the, the hands reaching for the object getting turned into what Gans called um, uh, a, a, a gesture of aborted appropriation. Um, and or a border gesture of, of 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 appropriation. In other words, instead of reaching for it, you kind of pull your hand back and then point to it instead. So the grasping gets converted into a pointing. And this, assuming this catches on, uh, which Gans doesn't assume it would have every time. Gans kind of says at one point there might have been a lot of scenes like this that that kind of that got broken up and that and that failed and so on. All it had to do is to take one time. And if it takes one time and everybody now puts forward that same sign, then then you actually have the beginnings of language. Yeah, then, and, and the way it was described in, in the book and, and I'd seen it described elsewhere was for some people, they might hear that and they're trying to wrap their head around it. And so the idea, ultimately, the reason this might take off is because it does mitigate conflict, because otherwise you have total feral anarchy and the advent of being able to negotiate both between and with this thing at the center that is the object of desire means that you're not actually tearing each other apart, which is desirable to that that group. And I think with the idea of the scene, some people might be comparing this to let's say the advent of fire or anything else. So it could be seen as one scene and something that I liked what you had just said, that maybe it started and stopped at various points, but there was a flashpoint when this took off because otherwise it, there was a pre and post this thing happening. Sorry to interrupt. I was just. Right. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. And, and, and by the way, Girard doesn't really ever speak in terms of a scene. This is really Gans's um, contribution. And it's a very important one, and 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 this this might actually be part of the you know the difficulty of of of, of engaging with the uh, with the originary hypothesis. Um, um, Girard is still thinking, uh, kind of in more um, I don't know maybe I'm being a little bit unfair to him, but but more social scientific terms that he spoke about it more in terms of a mechanism. So there's kind of a causality, but uh, but Gans really insists that something like this had to have happened, right? We really do have a unique formative event that creates humanity and you know the kind of supplementary sort of proof i mean proof is not really the right word but you know in a certain sense kind of confirmation um is the importance of uh, uh some kind of event usually divinely you know a divine event or a divinely created or sanctioned event that is shared across a lot of you know mythologies Right, most obviously, you know, going back to the Hebrew Bible and then Christianity, right? God just creating humanity, but but you see the same kind of thing. The idea that this came out and that humans came about in some kind of event, that there had to be some kind of transformation to bring them about, um, is 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 you know seems to be kind of part of the the broader human, um, I don't know, um, patrimony inheritance. So, you yeah. Know, you want to talk about it that is true and, and just to go off on a tangent there uh, people might recall many many episodes ago we were discussing a book that i quite like which was um the heroic and heroes through time by thomas carlyle i believe it was and he had made an interesting point a lot of mythologists make this point that what a lot of these especially if you go back further to like you know odin and things like that what they were known for they think, okay, what makes a god? What makes this hero figure? And typically what it is, they go off into the unknown, whatever that unknown is, and bring back information. And in the case of, I believe it's Odin. I'm going to have pagans jumping down my throat if I get this wrong. I'm pretty sure it was Odin. And what he was famous for was inventing runes. And what he found was a commonality, even within you know the monotheistic religions, of bringing back the word, of having some unique communicative communicative link with the unknown but anyway point being that information and communication seems to sit at the very center of a lot of these and it as you further go back it's way more literal but it's essentially the same thing sorry to interrupt oh yes well that's very interesting right yeah in the beginning was the word right that's the that's the i guess the most explicit 
formulation of it and and uh, uh, and the word was with God and so these two things come together right and this is central to uh, to the original hypothesis to G to GA which is that uh, the the um, the origin of language is also the origin of the sacred or of God and it's the origin of the human um, which is to say that human and, and and God the human and God come into being together and they come into being through language and then it's at that point where what you were talking about before really comes into it where there's a kind of negation because then then you have the the, the center as a sort of um attractive and and repellent being right so so um the the center is is therefore what's what's most attractive what we want to possess but at the same time this kind of negation is you could say emanating or being communicated from it right it's also the thing that you can't touch right it's the thing that you can't approach that you can't possess and uh um, and and you know and this is why ritual is so important, right? Ritual again is a very specific human thing, right? We 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 have, you know, still even even in in the secular world we have we have these very elaborate ways in which we're allowed to approach some kind of you know object or some kind of good that we have in common, uh, because it, it, it how you how you approach something how you how you kind of even how you eat, I mean, even even things like table manners and, and, and the way food is distributed at a table, right? All, all of these things, you know, we, we, we can kind of trace back to the originary scene because you can't just, you know, imagine you're all sitting at a table and everyone just started grabbing from from the center. I mean, you could kind of see this in a movie and and, and uh, or a TV show. They'll, they'll they'll show this sometimes, and it can be it's kind of funny, but it's kind of funny because you know it doesn't it it, it can't really work that way. Um, and even if it does work that way, it, it's because even even so, everyone's kind of, in a sense, ordered and civilized enough that they're still going to avoid getting in each other's way. So even this becomes a kind of ritualized approach. But there's always a ritualized approach. There's always, you know, you go towards something and you have to see where everybody else is in relation towards it and, and, and so on. Yes, and that's what's so fascinating about it. It's that from this, so right now what we're describing is a very you know ancient scene so the center would be food but it could also be water and the point is that as a group starts to advance the most the key point of this is the creation of ritual and the replication of the ritual and that that pointing is not only replicated amongst the group but it's replicated every single time in that exact way and this is where you start to see the birth of ritual because that center of the uh, group is the desire. I want that food, but maybe as the group advances, it gets more abstract and maybe it's like, I want it to rain. And now we start building these sort of rituals to call forth rain or to interface with that desire. And so it's this kind of feed, not a feedback loop that necessarily, that would be a negative connotation, but it's this, this is the birth of ritual and ritual as something that not only communicates with each other, but must be replicated precisely to the point where if you do it and you don't get what you want, you start to assume that, oh, I must have done that ritual wrong in some way. <laughs> yes, right, right. And and, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't really object to, to, to speaking in terms of, uh, of feedback mechanisms. That's, that, that's fine. Of course, it's a way of taking in information from 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 the external world and and yes in a sense this is really the first morality right getting the get, getting the ritual right and, and rituals of course as we all know get prescribed very carefully which is why they seem irrational which is why they seem crazy if you're not part of the group that that uh, that adheres to that ritual like why are people doing this why do they insist why do they get upset if you do it this slightly different way well i mean that, that that's why because that's how, how everyone ensures that we're all kind of facing the same center and we're facing it in the same way. We could be relied upon to approach it in prescribed ways and, uh, and so on. And, and um, so, uh, but, but then, you know, you're, you're right. It, it, you know, then the development of this uh, in, in part, I mean, part of the reason why it develops is um, uh, it, it has to be exactly the same way, but, but it, it's kind of, still, it's kind of tough to confirm that. Right. Because, um, however you did it last time, I mean, the, 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 the scene, the, the ritual is, is essentially the commemoration of the originary scene, right? And that's, and that's in a sense what enforces it. Right. It's the way a particular community remembers that. Um, but, you know, memories get, uh, you know, are, are not exactly 100% reliable, 
right? Now, and that, that goes for group memories as well. So the very insistence that it be the same introduces a kind of drift as well. Um, because what counts as the same, well, that, you know, that kind of gets enforced on the scene itself. It can be enforced in a more gentle way. It can be enforced in a more brutal way, right? Um, but, uh, but it's kind of a judgment call that, that, that's being made by, by people on the scene. And, and, you know, in a sense, this is how certain forms of authority start to take shape, right? Yes. Whoever we trust to preside over the scene, you know, then we have something like a priest, Right. That, that's a great point. And, and that's what I kind of wanted to do to tie this to other things. People might be hearing this and they might be hearing a few echoes of things they heard before, because uh, one point I want to make was Anthropomorphics, uh, your book it came out in parallel with uh, Nemesis by C.A. Bond. In the, in the foreword, it right. says, in many ways, these are complementary pieces. And we've covered uh, the Italian elite theory and we've covered De Juvenel here in the past. So what I think people might notice is, that, oh, there's a lot of talk of this thing called the center. And I think there's a lot of, you know, people in our scene right now, you know, I think uh, uh, Joel Davis is big on this, but, you know, the idea of, you know, the center of society and then kind of going out from there. And so what I found so fascinating about this is, you know, it's answering the question, what, what do we mean by center? What is the center? How does it function? What is it composed of? Because people kind of know, they would say, oh, the center is the monarchy, the center could be the priest class, and we know politically how that shakes out. But what I found fascinating about this is it seeks to answer the question of, but what's the foundation of that? What are the components? How do these values evolve over time? And I think one criticism I'd heard on this, and I'm not, I'm not saying I, I necessarily agree with it, but uh, it was covered in, there was this article that came out in the Firstness Journal <laughs> uh, titled, Generative Anthropology is Bullshit. Um, and we don't need to talk about that if you don't want, but what I found was there was a critique of this idea of the scene. You know, this critique of the idea is like, oh, it's all imaginary. You're just coming up with the scene. Uh, what I would say to that is, well, if you're going back far enough, you kind of have to. You know, if we're talking about the not just how certain languages developed, but the the development of language itself, why did we come up? Why did this evolve over time? I think you kind of need to get into this intersection of science, but also philosophy, but also mythology. Like it's all in the same sort of crucible. Now, does that sound fair, or am I way out? Well, of that? Course, you know, this brings us back to ritual as well, right? A ritual, a ritual is always a theme, right? And 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 it's. You know, and it's dramatized, right? Something's happening in the ritual. This is this has been kind of lost in a lot of ritual over time. But but early rituals um, were not seen as just symbolic. It it was really a way of engaging in a kind of exchange with whatever being you you saw as at the center, right? Whatever your god, you're you're doing something, and an exchange whatever, you know, God or, you know, whatever the name of, of, of the deity is, is going to do something for you in exchange. And so the, the, it's, the ritual is, is effective, right? It's doing something. And, you know, and we, which is why it's got, it's not only a scene, but there's a kind of, you know, drama to it, right? There, there, there's kind of a narrative built into it. We do this so that something else will happen as a result of us doing this. But yeah, try and, you know, in, in a way there is a, the, you know, you can't test this stuff out. Try and imagine human beings not being on a scene. You doing something that doesn't have a reference to anybody else in any situation where you're not, you're not, you, you wouldn't be talking to, to somebody else. You wouldn't be listening to anybody else. You wouldn't be answering anybody else. Then, then where would you be exactly? But, um, um, and well, this, that, that's a that's a funny thing. Let me just do a quick tangent yeah, yeah, there for no. people listening. Um, I for, I mentioned this in our previous episode. I forget what book it was from. I think it was a psychological book, but it was something about how draw how re basically what you said. Drama is important because when you witness a dramatic performance, and this is this could be plays, this could be TV, this could be whatever, your brain interprets that almost as if you were doing it yourself. So the purpose of drama is not only, it's not just to keep us busy and entertain us, although oftentimes that's what it is, but you know, drama as a function of society is also to play out scenarios 
that your brain might be interpreting as you witnessing something real. <laughs> so your brain, in terms of like judging what you just saw or the lessons or the morals, there's really no difference than if you just saw it. And, you know, of course, we can go off into how does that explain Transformers? But I'm talking about, you know, the <laughs> core purpose of, of a dramatic representation. Well, yes, and, and and the roots are still in ritual and 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 myth. The, the way I was reading myth there, and here I'm staying very close to to, to Gans's reading of myth, uh, is 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 really uh, an interpretation of ritual, right? Because um, the uh, ritual again, you're on, you're on, you're on this scene. You're you're asking, and and it's a, and it's it's a sacrificial scene as well, right? I mean, if you look at the really the earliest people. Their, their gods are the animals that they're killing and eating, right? They're, they're in a kind of exchange relation with, with the animal. You're killing, you know, you're killing the deer, but, it, you know, the deer is really just one, you know, deer that, you know, can be traced back to the deer god. Right, and you are, and 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 you 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 kill the deer, and 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 the group brings it back, and and brings it to the to the sacrificial center, and this this has two effects. One, you give a little piece back to the deer god, and in a sense, you kind of thank the deer god for for allowing you to capture this deer for for feeding you, and you kind of also pledge to you know to to you know to fulfill the rituals of 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 you know of, of gratitude and so on, and it also ensures that the, the food is distributed fairly. It's distributed as part of the of part of the ritual scene, as well. Now, of course, um, it doesn't always work, right? And 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 sometimes, and this is, goes back to something you you were speaking about earlier on as well. Um, the ritual doesn't that doesn't work. You you ask the god to, to to give you more deer, but then you know you have a couple of weeks where maybe you don't come across any deer, and so uh, some, something went wrong. The god isn't doing what uh, what you took the god to be promising to do. So you've got to make sense of that. Well, how do you make sense of it? Well, someone someone did something wrong. Um, the god maybe has his own reasons for withholding this. Maybe he's testing you. Maybe he's, you know, maybe some of you have, have, have you know, have, you know, uh, performed the ritual, but with insufficient enthusiasm, or you weren't really sincere about it. And this introduces the possibility for all these narrative interpretations of the ritual. And these narrative interpretations of the ritual become myths and, and those kinds of stories that, that, that you were referring to before. Yeah, someone going off. And getting uh, and, and and getting some kind of information and bringing it back. Well, you could see this developing out of you know the ritual going wrong and someone coming back and and and, and providing a way to make the ritual go right. And and the development comes when um, you know you the the, the and this, in a sense the scene expands insofar as the exchange becomes broader. Right. It's right. no longer we bring you a piece of meat. And you give us a, a deer within the next forty-eight hours or something, right? Which is in a sense the you know the the, the most kind of primitive form of exchange. But it becomes more. Um, uh, we'll you know we'll we'll follow these rituals and we'll hunt in the right way and we'll you know we'll do things like uh, like marry each other in the right way and and we'll do all kinds of other things. And you'll not only give us meat, but you'll also kind of um, you know, give us rain and 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 uh, and help us to settle our disputes and and so on. So all these other you know elements of the exchange get get introduced into it. And and again, there's there's an increasing dramatic and narrative richness that develops along the way. Yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to say what I found so fascinating about stuff like that is you know some people might call this the Faustian spirit. I just call it the beautiful audacity of that transition of not only am I interfacing with the unknown i'm making demands of it you know the audacity of developing a priest class or developing and we'll get to this in a second mm -hmm. a person that occupies that center kind of looking into the unknown saying we want this now and i i love that that's so cool that you know it's almost like an anti-slave morality it's like i'm going to figure i'm going to develop a language to talk to the universe and then start building that dramatic relationship with it almost as a way to have a seat at the table, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I also obviously found it very, very interesting as well. And, and uh, you know, um, even 
if, if we look forward, you know, uh, in, into development of things like technology, I think it even helps to start to think about uh, technology as, as a kind of exchange with reality, as kind of making demands and 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 uh, um, and and, uh, uh, and responding to the refusal of this demand or or, or the conditional granting of this demand and, and so on. In other words, I think we're still operating within within the same space. Um, but uh, but you you said you wanted to get into the to, to the occupation of the center, uh, and that's kind of where I was going as well. So so we, we were kind of on a convergent path here. So let's so 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 let's follow up on that because um, in, in a sense, if 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 I introduced the paradigm shift into all this with regard to Gans, it's it, it's concerning the question of the center um, because. Um, uh, Gans keeps us focused on the center, on the originary scene, and through the development of ritual. And this is, you know, um, this is stuff that where that where his analysis is really, you know, quite, uh, you know, quite uh, powerful. Um, and uh, but but uh, it, it, he he um, uh, in a certain sense he he kind of agrees with Girard about the importance of Christianity. Um, and I mean, I don't. I, I also, you know, consider this very important, of course. But uh, um, uh, Gantz seems to see, sees a sort of uh, a decentering that 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 follows from Christianity, um, and he he kind of takes the the sacrality of the individual, uh, which in a sense results from Christianity. Right? If this if this individual um, could be um, could be sort of you know could be God. Then 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 there's something potentially sacred about each individual. From from a, a strict Christian perspective, this might be heretical. I'm not I'm not sure. But but you know thinking about it logically, um, it makes sense to say that anyone then who's being scapegoated uh, takes on a certain kind of sacrality. Um, and uh, since any individual could be potentially scapegoated, um, then every individual becomes, and of course, even, you know, the Bible speaks about, you know, humans being created in God's image, and this then is part of what it means to be created in God's image, that anyone could be treated as this kind of sacrificial center. And for Gans, this implied a kind of decentering, which he then sees as being realized institutionally through market society and through liberal democracy right where 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 things kind of uh, devolve down to the individual as the as the kind of locus of significance and so um you know this this is where where i in a sense kind of went in a different direction um and this was all happening of course you mentioned you mentioned uh you know chris bond's book before um and uh, and and of course, I was I was you kind know, of familiarizing myself with 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 his work and and related work within NRX and and, and so on at the time. And and uh, um, I had been even on my own, which even on my own, I had been kind of found myself confronting the limits of of Gans's uh, not only endorsement of, of of liberal democracy and the market society, but but his argument that this was sort of where GA led. Um, and I found myself in a kind of, you know, to go back to, 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 to Kuhn, um, and this, this for me was a kind of, uh, you know, paradigm crisis, right? Where, where um, which called for a sort of, you know, revolutionary science, right? So the, uh, um, the, 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 what's it called? The, the normal science of GA seemed to me to be in crisis because it couldn't account for, um, for the way the political system was operating in ways that it really shouldn't, according to you know to, to Gans's view of it, and so this is part of the reason I started looking outside of more mainstream outlets and, and came across things like you know again I found obviously I found Chris Bond's you know model to be to to be the most uh, um, since the most economical one one to work with and the one that most coincided with um, with with GA because then you know. Um, all that I needed to do within GA was to to make, in a sense, the obvious point that there's still a center, right? A center in again in the more just the more obvious commonsensical sense that uh, um, there's a center of authority, there's a center of power, 
right. and that not only never went away, but it became more powerful and more all-encompassing and more an inescapable reference point over the centuries. And, you know, so obviously now, you know, this is kind of a commonplace observation now that, that you know, that, you know, today's liberal democratic state has powers and, and, and the ability to control you and to surveil you and, and, and to, to interfere with your lives that goes way beyond the most, you know, totalizing ancient emperor, right? The Egyptian pharaohs couldn't dream of having this kind of power over their subjects. So it seemed to me this was this huge kind of like this dark matter within, within society that, that, that Gans not only wasn't accounting for, but in a sense kind of didn't really want to look yeah. for that. And what's interesting is I find it has explanatory power the further you go back. So some people would obviously look at the modern world and say, where does this fit in? But, you know, it answers the question, like when we talk about Juvenel and, and the center of society, they'll say, oh, that's also, that's the monarchy, that's the priest class. And it says, okay, well, how did they get there? And if you look at what defined a monarchy, if you look at these great mythological figures, even in Britain and, and the British kings and the idea of, coming from a lineage of someone further back who occupied that center, like what is the monarchy and what is the priest class except trying to carry on that tradition through time? And that is what, in essence, tradition is, I think. And so, you know, in a, a political sense, you could point to the monarchy, you could point to aristocracy, but then this seeks to say, okay, how do you actually become a monarch? And of course, you can't have that now, most likely you can't go back, but for a huge percentage of human history that was how it's run and so that's again that's the practical explanation of why this happens and what what actually separates a monarch from a tyrant we know there is a difference and you could say oh a tyrant is just someone who treats people badly but i think there's also a stronger disconnect almost a spiritual disconnect between who they are and what they are the center they're supposed to be serving and you could say that's why people rise up against them for example well, you know, this 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 gets us into you know to a lot of very interesting issues. But uh, you know, to to go back to the beginning, yeah, the first, uh, the the you know the, the the first person who occupied the center um, was uh, you know again this is you know this is Gans's work uh, and and he's he's borrowing from uh, the anthropologist uh, Marshall Salins um, is is what what you know anthropologists called the big man, right? Which is in these these kind of very um, primitive social orders, um, but they're getting less primitive, right? Because they're, they're, they're creating more wealth and they're starting to differentiate into families and so on. So it's not this one single sort of hunter gatherer group anymore. And, and, at, and at some point, um, someone, and this is, you know, in a sense, this is kind of most, uh, to go back to what you were saying before about, uh, you know, Faustianism and, and so on, in a sense, this is the most revolutionary gesture in human history, to right to just take over the sacred center, and and to occupy it, and now all the tribute comes to you and operates through you. And Gans makes the point, like you know, like like Salen makes the point, which is that this was not, um, you know, the the person who occupied the center didn't just kind of gather up all the food to, to himself and just kind of gobble it all down and 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 just you know leave a few scraps for others. It was exactly the opposite, right? It was he he. The one who occupied the center was the most, um, uh, like I a don't benevolent know. figure. Yeah. yeah, well, the hardest working, the 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 most responsible, the most authoritative, who kind of stepped in and and yes, you know, saw to you know the 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 just distribution of 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 the social product and the, and I'm sure the just ordering of social relations as well. And, and Salen makes the point, which, which, you know, which Gans, you know, reiterates that, uh, that very often the big man would eat less than others because he had to make sure that, 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 you know, that distribution took place and, uh, um, and, and, and social order was, was kept. And, and, uh, and so obviously, yeah, this gives us a very different view of social centrality and gives a very different view of hierarchy than we're going to get today from democratic ideology. Right, and a lot of this, of course, is countering, um, you know, de democratic ideology, and, and starting with, and you know, one of one of the questions that you had sent me that that we might talk about uh, is is what interested me originally about uh, about GA, and at the time, 
it was the critique of victimary thinking. I think that that drew me in um, when I when I first came across uh, GA back in I guess it must have been you know the very late nineties, um, and you know this really counters you know victimary thinking right For victimary thinking. Um, every relation of hierarchy is a relation of oppression, right? And even if the, the, the person in charge seems like he's okay and seems like uh, he's got the interest of everyone, all, all of that's just a mask. It's just a guise, right? It's just really the, the ideology that, that, that he's producing in order to exploit and oppress everyone else, right? This is, this is very deeply ingrained already on, on, on all sides of the political spectrum. Right, that whoever's in charge, they're, they're inherently untrustworthy. They're, they they they've got some scam going, or or they're oppressing us, and and so on. And of course, in in actuality, that's very often the case. I'm I'm not saying that that everyone is who's in power is using is using their power well, but 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 I I am arguing for a kind of reversal in the presumption uh, of 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 guilt and innocence here, in the sense that we should start from the assumption that someone does need to be at the center again unless we want to go back to tiny hunter gatherer groups or you know even today you know you could say you could still have these kinds of groups where there's an object at the center and there's no individual at the center to an extent if we're talking about you know whatever a group of friends that get together um even there i would i would say that there's always kind of at least shifting authority relations someone seizes the center you know, here and there to, to, to keep things going. But it's only on that very small scale, right? And here we're going to get into an argument with David Graeber at some point, but but we can leave that aside for, for now. <laughs> uh, if you get in, if you get into a, into a larger, into a larger scale, someone, someone is occupying the center, right? How, however, they're doing it. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the big man is not, you know, he's not a king yet, and it's still very provisional. He can get replaced and, and so on. It's not kind of formalized in any way. But that, you know, I think you have to see that as a starting point to what then is going to become a very long and very complex history of sacral kinship and and uh, and and then divine kinship, kingship and uh, and 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 the the ancient god emperors and so on, and then down into in, in, into the, the the more modern monarchs and so on. And as you say, that that's the way. Um, almost all of human history since, again, uh, uh, you know, once we got, we, we moved past the hunter-gatherer stage, all human history has, has, has taken that form. Now, you were saying we can't go back. Well, in a certain sense, we can't go back to the exact same thing. But um, I do think that this is really the central political question today, which is we, we still have these people at the center, right? Well, you know, why, why is that? We're all we're Democrats. We believe in freedom, supposedly. We believe in equal rights. We believe in in, in decentralizing power. Everybody, almost everybody, claims to believe in these things, and yet every country has, you know, you still have kings, but if they don't have a king, they have a president, or they have a prime minister, or or, or, or there's some other name for it. But there's always someone that you that you have to go to, right? Yeah, well, especially um, when some people push back on elite theory or whatever people there's different names for it people will they only really disagree on who is being depicted as the elite but i would say you're not against the concept of there being an elite that seems patently obvious to me and what's interesting what you just said is like there exists a center whether you like it or not and what i find what makes this most relevant i think to a modern audience is uh what we were just talking about was typically whoever occupied the center came from that group and this is why you know, the lineage was so important uh, in passing this down traditionally, especially in monarchy. But in the modern era, who we choose to occupy the center is almost the opposite. We like revolutionary outsiders, which is the complete antithesis to what should typically occupy the center. And we almost feel suspicious, especially in our media or the stories we tell of someone who isn't like a cleansing force coming from outside of the group. And that's what we're telling each other these days. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there is this kind of interesting history, history of, of uh, which I don't know so much about, um, but apparently there was a lot of this in, in, in the Greek um, city-states of, of actually kind of bringing in an outsider to be the king or to make your laws or whatever. But you're talking about something different, uh, w w which is um, that, yeah, no, no one can occupy the center now without kind of disavowing their occupation of the center, Right. right? 
you, you have to kind of say, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this like, you know, I don't really, I'm not really occupying this position of power. I'm really doing it in the name of others. And I'm really doing it against all these others who would unjustly occupy the center, right? I'm a, it's almost like it's, it's a kind of this provisional occupation of the center in, in, in the name of the people in order to prevent these real tyrant, tyrants from taking control. And yes, you can translate almost all contemporary political discourse. In, in, into those terms, and the funny thing about it is, is, is that all of this serves to further centralize power, right? And this is part of that juvenile, juvenilean um, insight, right? Think about you know the, the 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 people who say are invested in a human rights worldview. They see everything in terms of human rights. They go around the world, you know, Amnesty International types. You go around the world looking for people who are having their human rights violated, looking for states. That, that are violating people's human rights and issuing reports and complaining about it and saying, well, something needs to be done about this. Well, who in the world could do something about all of these violations of human rights if not some power more powerful than the one that's violating the human rights in the first place? In other words, all this just goes back to a much more powerful, a much more powerful state that will be able to be everywhere and making sure that not a single group of any kind is having their, vi their, their rights violated by a single member of any other group of any other kind, right? Well, you know, if you start to think about the, the, the kind of, you know, power and oversight that would be required to, 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 to fulfill, you know, the, the political desires of, 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 of the human rights worshiper, you're imagining, well, the state that, that, you know, that was maybe starting to see come into existence now and that we've been seeing come into existence really over the past 50 years or so. And that, in a sense, that's, the, that's always the justification that the state is necessary to, to interfere with and break up these, you know, these tyrannies. Yeah, and that's oh. a fa fascinating take because uh, this is something, uh, we had covered The Ancient City at one point, and it's a very, very good book. A lot of people, and it kind of ties into this, but you had also made a comment, I believe, in Anthropomorphics, and we kind of touched on this a minute ago, but, you know, the, the rise of, let's say Christianity specifically. And it was kind of what I would call like redefining the center, which is sort of what you're describing. And so what we had previously with the rise of Christianity in Rome was the center of the Roman empire versus the center of the empire of God and the empire of God almost redefining what the center is. So, you know, your center of society is kind of regional. Here comes this new conceptualization of the center of all humanity. And that in itself might seem more attractive. And in that sense, this, what we're seeing now is just an outgrowth of that, of us, the, we call them liberals, we can call them, you know, there's a lot of different names for them, but kind of redefining the center to encompass more of humanity, which makes it seem truer to people. Does that sound like anything that makes yeah. sense or... Well, yes, and of course, you know the you know the, this is this is the appeal and, and, and the power of universalism, right? Uh, that it seems to include more and more people, and you 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 feel like you could be included if you imagine yourself as having been excluded, um, without having to think too much about you know the, the the mechanisms of power that would make it possible for you to be included, and what it would even end up meaning. For you to what it would end up meaning for you to be included, included in what exactly? If your focus is on, all right, these people are excluding me, and I want someone to come along and stop them from excluding me, excluding me. If that's your sole focus, then you're focused on kind of a bad center, and you just have this vague hope of of, of some good center coming along and and, and displacing it. Um, but you don't know what that supposedly good center is going to look like. It's it's not going to ask your permission. In determining exactly how to make sure that you're included and it's going to end up uh you know it might end up telling you a little bit down the way that now you're one of the excluders and now you have to step aside and we're gonna we're, we're gonna include someone else at, at your expense because you're getting in the way now yeah and what's interesting also is that we talk about the center as if it's sort of kind of this abstract thing but as we'll get to in a second the center becomes just as real as anything and um, when just to go cycle back to the start, as people are listening, just to clarify, it, it within this model, 
and a lot of people have kind of caught on to this in different ways. There's no such thing really as a completely unique person, which flies in the face of what a lot of people are taught in a, a rationalist sort of society. But this idea, and everyone kind of knows this when they say learning a different language is a great example. Learning a different language actually changes how you think that there's certain values and concepts that exist in Russian that don't, first of all, they don't translate very well. Chinese, China is a very, another great example, but Russia we'll just use for now. Like, like it, to exist, to be brought up in that system linguistically changes how you see the world and changes, you know, your very mind. So this idea of you, you, the individual as a product of this center, which exists just as I think it was described in the book as the center is nothing but the collective signifying capacity of the community and as a, that everyone's kind of gathered around. So you are part of this collective, whether you want to or not. And I think it's a problem with a lot of, you know, Anglos such as myself. We, we kind of brought up in this sort of post enlightenment existentialist, you know, rational society and thinking, oh, that applies to everyone. And then we've seen where that gets us. But that realizing that, oh, the way that I think specifically might not be universal, that it was a different center, perhaps than another civilization center. That's so for some people kind of trying to wrap their heads around it. That's one way I like to look at it. I don't know if that's good or bad, but what do you well, think? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 I speak about this a lot of times in terms of idioms and, and what you're referring to in terms of language. I mean, this this is part of the reason I got very interested. And in, I mean, I'm still interested. I haven't done much with it very recently, but I'm, but I'm sure I'll be coming back to, to Anna Wierzbicki's work, um, which which addresses exactly the issue that that uh, that you're talking about. Of course, I talk about her in uh, in anthropomorphics, um, and uh, she um, she she kind of both confirms the superior wharf hypothesis about language and at the same time transcends it right she confirms it by providing a way of showing in a very in very precise ways that words in one language don't translate into other languages and she's focused in particular on english but she she does a lot of contrasting with russia russian and polish and and, and, and other languages as well um, and in fact, she she wants to show for for reasons that you're getting at here. Um, again, she's not. I don't think I'm pretty sure she's not politically conservative, um, but she's. Uh, I, I would say politically, she's um, she's issuing a check on on English, in a sense, a kind of check and balance <laughs> on on English as as the language that has tended to become the universal language. Of, of, of the modern period. And she spends a lot of time going through all of these concepts that if you're an English speaker, you, you think are just kind of commonsensical, self-evident, universal concepts. And she goes through them showing, no, these, these are specifically English concepts. They don't, they don't exist in other languages. And again, some of the most basic ones, ones like experience, ones like evidence, sense, Words like these, again, that, that all of these Anglo philosophies have been built out of. And she's showing these are not these are not words that just translate. Yeah. I, I think that another example you gave was the concept of universality itself doesn't exist, like outside of certain uh, languages. That that might be out of that I don't remember. It's po it's possible. I don't I don't think I don't think Wisbeka gets at that because that's already a more complex concept, and she's kind of sticking to to what seem to be the more the more simple ones. I mean, we could see we it's easy to see that universalization must have been kind of invented at some point as right. a concept, but it's but it's easy to think that sense is just kind of built into the language, right? It's not uh, it's not something you would have to imagine someone inventing the concept of sense. But but again, you might be right. I'm not I'm not sure but but uh, but but it's certainly the case that that yeah, you know that universality, universalization is also not universally translatable. And um and and it it, it you know and there there are political implications that follow from this and I think one of them is that um you you uh you you need to be, you know, there are there are different centers in that case. Now we do have the problem of of you know of something like a global society. We can get to, we can get to that in a minute. But but there there are definitely um, uh, even even as delegated centers, there 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 are different centers, right? And and uh, 
Um, and uh, it's if you, if you want even your delegated center to have the authority that you're delegating to it, you want to enhance the idiomatic structure of that center. In other words, you want to tell, you you want to acknowledge that it's going to have its own language, even if it didn't have one before. Just by being, just by you know, any institution creates its own kind of lingo, right? And certainly, any any kind of group or any institution or any social order is going to develop its own language, its own ways of referring to things that would require translation and explanation to outsiders. Now, there's a lot of hostility towards that if you're a centralizer, because this stuff always gets in the way, right? And you want to always replace these more local terms with the terms that kind of get minted by by specialists at think tanks and at universities and so on. So you can just kind of get rid of all that stuff and you can just kind of translate your uh, agenda directly into all these different levels. Um, but th th this ultimately leads to more confusion and more dysfunction. And it's much better to, to take the, 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 the seemingly more um, uh, delayed route of enhancing and acknowledging and respecting the different idioms you know idioms in the sense that that just terms that mean something for a particular community that they don't mean for people outside that community and and, and our language is always idiomatic in that sense so if, you know you you respect the idioms and you know and it's and a sign of respect is actually to speak in somebody else's idiom um, rather than insisting that they speak in your idiom. And, and even if you are the superior speaking to an inferior within an institution, that's the case as well. I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, you, you should want to, you, you should want people to have, you know, it's, it's a, it is a question of, 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 you know, human richness as well. What's but interesting, which is, go ahead. Yeah. Also, I was going to say, this is something we talked about very recently, and we're going to get into information theory in a second. But in terms of just language, uh, one thing we had remarked on, and this has been borne out by some studies, but the, the way our, the language itself, let's say English as an example, the way English has, like what you're describing is that it's almost an attack on idioms. And I would almost say an attack on the semantic meaning of things. So there's the the word that has the definition, but then there's some. There has to almost be a hidden meaning because there are forces in society that keep trying to play musical chairs with words themselves. I think it was um, um, what's his last name it was Norbert. He was the guy who invented the term cybernetics, but he was trying to break down like what is a message and a message. Yeah, Wiener. Yeah, Norbert Wiener. Yeah, Norwiener, and he said a message has three components. There's uh, the kind of the oral meaning, the sound, then there's the definitive meaning, but then there's a semantic meaning. And the semantic meaning works at a lower level, and I would argue that's kind of what we're talking about. Like, we know the word, but we know the context. And this idea that you, that the entire idea that we are in a society right now that relies so much on dog whistles, double talk, and encoding meanings into words that didn't have those meanings as a way to communicate. Like the way to think of it, it's almost like this center semantic model existing beneath the actual words themselves. Like there's almost a spirit to the communication that is trying to separate from the words because the words are getting us in trouble now. <laughs> so it's like a, a spirit looking for a body in a sense. I know it sounds very kooky and abstract to people, but, you know, go listen to the clip we did everyone on, you know, uh, the information theory and things like that. And we'll get to more of that in a second. But I just wanted to throw that at you to see if that makes any sense at all. Or well, anything. well, yeah, yes. I mean, and, and you know, the idioms always reassert themselves in, in, in the force of being kind of expropriated if we, and, and, and violated and, and, uh, um, and, and, and translated. Um, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of political activity is, is involved in creating, um, in creating new idioms that are in some sense resistant Right, kind of, you know, you, you build, you know, these kind of immune properties into an idiom, so 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 others can't use them, and at least they can't use them for purposes um, alien to your own. And you know, anyone anyone who kind of sees now, the, you know, obviously the, you know, what was the alt right, I guess, is now more more often called the dissident right, um, is 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 a very good example of, of of a political tendency movement 
that that has developed some very specific idioms that that are verbal, that are visual, and so on. Right? There's a whole meme culture and so on. And and anyone, you know, anytime you come across a uh, um, say a mainstream journalist kind of looking into this and finding this kind of strange alien culture and and and, and you could see they try and get into it and try and translate and you know, this means this and this means this and this means this and you could see the struggle that they're that they're having with it right to kind of try and get you know get their hands on on these kind of meanings that that will that on these these words and these phrases and these memes and images and so on that were in a, in a sense designed precisely to resist this kind of thing and and, and, and if they ever do get a handle on it the 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 idiom will be will be shifted will have been shifted by you know by the time they, they you know they get around to to publishing it at least in 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 book form and so kind of preserving and, and recuperating and, and 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 holding on to these you know to these idioms um is is um uh, it's a kind of educational project um and the self-educational project and, and 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 it's and it's important and it doesn't mean you don't um, analyze the words, right? That's something that's new. We can't, we're, we're at the point where we can't have a kind of, you know, ban on analyzing things, right? Um, but, right. but analyzing things doesn't necessarily have to coincide with, um, criticizing things and showing this, I think is, is if I understood you, this is what you were getting at before. It doesn't, it doesn't mean showing that they have some other, you know, encoded meaning that belongs to our political enemies and, and, and therefore needs to be kind of outed and, and, and opposed. Um, you, can, you can analyze your own meanings and you can do it in a sympathetic way and you could do it in such a way that, 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 you know, it becomes part of the conversation as well. And I certainly hope that the work that, that, that I'm doing um, in its focus on language um, is you know, does provide a way of looking at the way in which we talk and the way in which we use languages, the way in which we use images, and so on. Um, and it gives us a way, again, I think, you know, where's, where's Bitsky's work is very helpful in this regard. There's a constant work of translation, and, 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 and you, w w it's good if you're doing this within your own, you know, within your own groups, within your own conversations as well, right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to, again, we're very used to thinking because a lot of modernity was involved in kind of debunking, right? Yeah. Um, traditional idioms, right? Yeah. Um, so we tend to think that any kind of analytical perspective on idioms, traditional or otherwise, must come with this debunking agenda. Um, but it, but it's not the case at all. That doesn't have to be. That doesn't have to happen, right? And in fact, you you know you can analyze your own idioms, and you can you can do it in a way to to fortify them and to make them you know more transferable and 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 to make them a vehicle of communication and, and so on. But but you know I, I do want to come back to to, to the point about uh, um, even if even if we 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 talk about and we affirm we acknowledge this uh, this diversity of centers and, and and I think you know that will always be the case even if you know even if they ever succeeded in creating say a real global government. With someone in, you know, whatever Switzerland or whatever, who's really just kind of ruling things, um, you know, across across the world, whatever we want to, you know, whatever kind of nightmarish or other scenario we want to we want to attribute to that, there would still be, you know, uh, they'd, they'd still have to be someone who's in charge in uh, whatever Eurasia, and someone else who's in charge in this part of Africa, and someone else who's in charge of this part of North America, and so on. So that there'd still be these these, these localizations. Of authority and therefore localizations of, of, of culture and so on, um, but but the reverse holds as well, um, which is um, even if you imagine even even if you're a nationalist say and, and, and you imagine a world being kind of reconstructed, let's say we we kind of set aside the the UN and uh, the World Economic Forum and you know we get rid of all of these you know globalizing institutions and you know the world's organized around nation states well you know the nation states are still going to differ very considerably in terms of power and authority and they're still going to organize things and they're still going to create alliances and out of these alliances certain kinds of um norms are going to develop and there'll be either conflicts or there'll be various forms of negotiation across different blocks and the blocks themselves might get bigger I mean, this is this is a tendency that 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 is is kind of um, 
uh, I think that we that that is historically pretty close to invariant as well. So we're still looking at something like a, a global society with um, uh, with something like um, forms of authority and forms and and and, and norms that are communicated across different different social forms uh, so uh it's it, it it's then just a question of what you want that to look like even the ancient empires um were kind of aiming at something like that you know most most successfully of course rome right um and i don't think the you know the roman republic started with this goal of one day ruling the world but you know you conquer more and more societies and and then the republic doesn't work anymore and then you have an empire and the empire kind of sees more territories and someone attacks it and you suppress that attack and you take over that territory and so on so there are certain you know uh political processes here that that you know don't have to work through conquest but 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 are going to work one way or another so it seems to me we do have and i hope that that i'm helping you know i do want to help to you know to, to think about what uh you know what that would look like so that it's a way that that draws upon and helps create new idioms rather than suppressing idioms i think you know the 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 political all the political questions that that we have now i think ultimately come back to that so let, let me throw it back to you and see if that made sense to you oh it does and i see echoes of that now in what uh, when people are discussing for example um a multipolar world you know they're trying they're running up against what you talked about the fact that it seems that once we have no let's say no global hegemon you still have this this is also what napoleon was pretty much trying to do and trying to spread this sort of thing and even though it wasn't trying to conquer and turn everything into france it kind of ended up that way and that's why i find the multi polarity maybe even eurasianist angle kind of interesting i'm not a eurasianist but that's why i want to speak to more multipolar people to kind of solve the problem that we're talking about which is how can we make this this non-conquest and maybe a non-imperialist world and i think it's interesting that it comes back to language because people don't think language is as important as it is and that's why i liked anthropomorphics especially and the originary theory because it gives language and communication its moment in the spotlight because you know language some people see it oh it's just a method of communication i'm like well no it is the only method of communication what is it trying to do well the, and this is what we got into the um, norbert wiener it's like what you're actually trying to do is take a thought and implant it in someone else's head that like sending a message you're trying to duplicate it from point a to point b and the best way we can do that is with language but other people have different mechanisms for encoding and decoding that message and that's where a lot of our problems come from but one way to think about uh, a, a world where we use language as, as a way to perhaps mitigate this stuff is just finding better ways to essentially teleport a thought into someone else's head to get the point across to kind of translate these desires and maybe there are more commonalities than we we know but you know we we're stuck in these centers and we're trying to maybe resolve that but th that's why i say like everything kind of comes back to this effort and that's where you get into you know the mearsheimer neorealism stuff that's where this really maps onto geopolitics and where it becomes real which is what i, I liked more about anthropomorphics is your determination to say this is relevant to where we are now to people right now to the the people of the boots on the ground whatever you want to call it this is relevant to your life and your political existence well, and let me follow up on what you're saying by 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 also suggesting that this um, this original relation between ritual and myth, um, I think, is also important to keep in mind um, in terms of anchoring language and anchoring the different idioms in institutional relations, um, because I mean, in a sense, we. We don't have rituals in exactly the same sense as, say, you know, a community with a sacrificial center has, has rituals, but but there's still the same relationship between, um, uh, you know, language and, and and practice or language and institution, and and you know, um, what does need not so much to be debunked, but made more explicit 
is the way in which whenever we're speaking, we're, we're speaking as, let's say, bearers of all of these infrastructures and their technological infrastructures and their institutional infrastructures. And we want the way that we're speaking to, um, to, to they already reference the infrastructures by, by necessity. Um, but we want, I think, to th th that to happen more explicitly so, so that um, we are, and, and, and in a sense, this thing that the left always does is say, well, let's talk about power. Well, I mean, you know, everyone now is in a position to do that. That's, that's a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, the left thinks that if we talk about power, you kind of discredit something by showing that there's power. But once we accept that, yeah, there's power and, 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 and there's a center and there are hierarchies and so on, you're not discrediting anything by saying, well, let's look at the, let's look at the way power works and look at the way in which, you know, in a sense, this, for me, this is kind of, I guess, the ultimate, you know, approach to politics, which is um, to, to, to look at, at, at the way in which what we say lines up with what we're doing and what can be done, right? I mean, this is where I would really locate meaning, right? That where you're saying something and what what you're saying uh, can can uh, kind of reference various kinds of institutional practices. So in a sense, if you say, um, I want everyone to be free, uh, in a certain sense, that's that's meaningless. In a, in a very strict sense, because you don't really have a definition of freedom and you don't really have a way of referring to all the existing institutions and showing what how exactly they would be changed and could be changed in a way that would lead to everybody having freedom in a way that you would recognize them as being free, because you don't really even know exactly what you would recognize as being free when you say something like, I want everyone to be free. Um, so in a sense, that's kind of, so, so this idea, which goes back in, you know, philosophy, though, you know, the one philosophy I do have some, uh, some real uh, investment in is, is, is American pragmatism, and in particular, Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, and, and, uh, and, and he saw philosophy as, as, in a way, which goes back to the, the origins of philosophy, I, I, I guess, as, uh, as a way of just kind of testing and determining the meaning of words, right? So if you say something what does it mean? How would, how would everything else, you know, be operating in such a way that what you say actually means something? Um, and, 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 I, and I think that this, this, you know, this way of kind of lining up what we say um, with the, the, the kind of institutional realities and practices that we take to, um, to, to make what we say something else, something that someone else could say. That someone else could follow up on and we could see you know certain kinds of changes that we could trace back to this thing that i said that's when something really means something right when you when you can when, when someone else could follow up on it and do things and say things and you could say oh okay everyone did and said these things because this person said this in this place under these conditions and it got disseminated in this way and so on so i think you know grounding what we say very much in, 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 in these infrastructures, which is, you know, is, is consistent with a certain kind of, you know, a certain tendency within cybernetics as well, which is, which is, a, you know, also, you know, you keep referring to, and it's, it's, it's also a very interesting, you know, form of, I don't know, modern, postmodern thinking. Um, so, so, um, so again, uh, this, this, you know, at some times I, I, I talked about in terms of, you know, kind of, um, the, the ritual myth, um, complementarity becomes a kind of practice hypothesis complementarity in 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 uh, um in a post in a post sacred order and so um we do want to get i think more um more rigorous in what we're saying more you know more interested in finding ways of testing what what we're saying and we're making claims about global politics which of course we have to and and we should and so on well okay what kind of you know if we're talking about a global norm um which again is a good thing to talk about okay what kind of global norm recognizes that there's a particular you know set of institutions in place that there's a particular positioning of the u.s and all of its kind of satellites or, or, or vassal states, whatever you want to call them, and there's China, and there's Russia, and there's a particular distribution of forces. Well, okay, what global norm doesn't just say, well, I don't like all that stuff, but rather says, okay, what, 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 what would be kind of an idiom in which we could yeah. discuss 
affects the, these relationships in a way that we can imagine, whatever, say a real agreement, maybe across these different countries that, 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 would, that would mitigate, that would defer rather than, rather than incite conflict. And that, that's a very fascinating way to look. That's kind of what I was getting at before about different ways to communicate. Um, you know, we can think of it in a cybernetics way. I just use that as an example. And mm -hmm. another way, I liked what you'd said about maybe getting more serious about what it is we say and how we say it. And we were covering recently, you know, the development of English specifically. And at one time, you know, there was no dictionary. And so everyone, they had words, and we knew what words were, obviously, but there was different spellings. And then someone, I forget the name, it was around the 1600s, decided to sit down and standardize everything. And the, the entire concept of a dictionary is fascinating in relationship to the center, because let's say, like, the center is language. And what words are is, is a more advanced language. It's kind of the language thinking about itself. By having a definition, period... Right. That's that language almost analyzing itself. And so the center is almost becoming self-aware at this point and then trying to standardize everything. It's looking at yourself in a with a stronger magnifying glass. I like think, OK, we're trying to make sure everyone within this, you know, gather around the center is using the exact same words and more precisely. And that's why your civilization advances at that point, because you're almost getting postmodern you're getting more abstract about thinking about thinking and that's there now you've got philosophy now you've got branching off in all these crazy directions and you that in itself is a paradigm shift because the entire idea of thinking about thinking or trying to think about how others think about you thinking is such a t there was a point where we didn't have the words to describe something like that and that's actually kind of insane when you think about it but that in a sense, is what we're still trying to do, and but we're doing it in a much more precise and surgical way. And, and that's just to build off of what you were saying. And I think that is more necessary because our concepts keep enlarging and we're, we're lacking the words. And we need to, the problem we're trying to solve now, I think, is it is sociological and it is linguistic, but it's at such a level that it is all, also metaphysical. And that's where some people get confused. Like, this isn't hard science. I'm like, well, it can't be because we don't have the mechanisms to measure it at. and that's where i think people got upset with the originary theory where it's like what would you just there's no stone tablet that describes that this happens you know there's a where how do we know i'm like well you at this level you kind of have to think almost spiritually about it because there is no unless we have a time machine but even then i i struggle to think if how we could go back to that scene we wouldn't even have the words to describe that anyway well, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that, that language in a, in a sense has something miraculous to it. If you if you think about it a lot, how is how did we all ever you know come to to know that that particular words mean what they mean? I mean the you know this notion of the arbitrariness of 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 uh, of, of of language, which you know comes from Saussure and and the structuralists, uh, which is I mean which obviously I mean everybody knew that already. There's no you know there's no um, there's no relation between the word dog and the animal dog, because and we know that because dogs have are called by different names in different languages. But so how did we ever align ourselves around these arbitrary words? There's something miraculous about that. I think the originary hypothesis um, addresses, and that no one else addresses. But but the other stuff that you're talking about it really is all about literacy, um, and. And 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 literacy, you know, I, I I do you know say you know address this a lot in anthropomorphics, and I've been getting more and more interested in it, and, and it does seem to me more and more important in, in in some of the ways that you're that you're talking about, um, and it's you know in order to have writing, and here I'm really working with you know David Olson, but other you know historians uh, of, of 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 writing. I, I think will be, you know, will we'll bear this out as well. I mean, the first thing that 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 you have to do to to introduce a script, you know, an, al an alphabetical, um, you know, script in, in in order to record what people say, is um, you you have to treat language as an object, right? So even before you have the words, you you have the you have letters representing sounds, and this is not at all a simple thing to do. As anyone knows who tries to line up, even in English, the sounds you know the, the the sounds of English with the with the English letters, right? They don't they don't line up perfectly at all, which is why when, when there are a lot of times when I know how to pronounce something that we read, 
Yeah. Right. Um, and and a lot of choices have to get made here, especially if you don't. You know, I guess if we had an alphabet with two hundred letters, we can we could maybe even then it wouldn't work. But at least we can we can represent a lot more sounds. But then it, it's too much to learn. It's too hard. Right, so you have to kind of make these compromises, but you have to say, okay, this is a particular sound. We're going to represent it with A. This is a particular sound. We're going to represent it with P. This is a, rep a particular sound. Right, all that has to be done, which means that you have to see language as you could never have seen it before writing, as an object that you can kind of slice up, right, and you could break yeah. down with the different sounds. And of course, the same thing goes with words, right? And people probably didn't speak, think about. You know, individual words that you can kind of break off from larger sequences of of of, of speech before writing, right? We had to decide, right, how to how to write things out and how to um, and 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 how to kind of space out the writing, which actually comes a, a little bit later in 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 writing, spacing things out. And the same thing is true of something like grammar, right? What's you know what what, what counts as a grammatically correct sentence? And in an oral society, no one is thinking about these things. I think McLuhan said no no one ever made a grammatical error in an, in an oral community <laughs> because you know not which is not to say that everybody kind of spoke in a way that that matches the grammar handbooks it, it just means that the, the concept of a grammatical error didn't exist so 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 you couldn't say you you you, you got that wrong um you might not understand something you kind of model the right way of saying it but but you wouldn't kind of mark it as as a grammatical error so all of this stuff does become what you're saying. It's it's thinking about how we think because it's right. It's it's writing about how we use language. It's using language about how we use language, right? So it introduces this meta dimension into into our use of language. And yes, that that changes everything. Um, and that does and 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 um, you know I, I I won't go through the you know the whole discussion of anthropomorphics, but but to me. Um, uh, I think this is really, you know, writing and 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 trying to deal with um, with new problems and issues raised by literacy is really what what what's involved in first of all philosophy, um, and um, you know that 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 that's why that that's why there's a problem that you see in you know right away in the Platonic dialogues, right? You know, what does the word good mean, right? You would you wouldn't right. even think kind of say, well, what you know. Uh, you know, Plato. I mean, of course, Plato through Socrates kind of denounces writing in a way. But ob obviously, th this is in a society where writing has already made great advances. Otherwise, you you wouldn't be denouncing it, right? Um, so you know, if if you didn't have writing, you couldn't kind of single out a word like good, and all of a sudden start to realize, oh, this could mean a lot of different things in a lot of different concepts, in a lot of different contexts. It would just be, well, you know, you just say good this, good that, and 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 so on. Right, so that very, you know, that original reflection that kind of gets philosophy going already presupposes literacy, and the kinds of new mm. problems that that literacy um, that literacy imposes. And then all of you know all of the disciplines that follow from that, I think, are also involved in trying to work this out. And so we we are still trying to work this out. In a sense, the, the, I forget the way you put it before, but in a way, this is um, kind of a broader social intelligence. That we're now participating in, which is, you know, which for me is kind of a study of the of the center, right? We're yeah. studying the narratives of the center. That's the that's the way I, or at least one of the ways that 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 I like to talk about it. Yeah, and I love the description of the center almost as its own entity. I think in anthropomorphics, you describe it as having like a will of its own. That after so much such a time, it's like this is almost an animating force and almost an entity as it becomes gods and stuff. But it almost it has a, a will of its own. And this is where we get into information theory, which is something that's kind of the new thing I'm really into these days. And we covered it in a, a few times. We branched off of a talk we had on quantum mechanics, but information theory pairs really well with that. And my story here was I had read Anthropomorphics with Year, year ago, maybe two years ago. And it was a very good book. And what I found was the more I read into, you know, the hard sciences, you know, we were reading, um, this didn't get covered on the show, we were reading The Road to Reality by Roger Penrose. And we're reading like really hard science stuff. I found that as I got into quantum mechanics and as I got into the information theory, it seemed to validate a lot of what was uh, being described in the originary theory. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, and we talked about this in a clip recently, people. I won't go into it right now. Go look at that. But in short, um, when we talk about information theory, it's like people hear information. They think, oh, that's just like a, an email. It's computers and stuff. It's like, well, no, information exists in the material 
world as if anything else. And so what we, I think the line we had was something akin to your body is more information than you think. And information is more corporeal, corporeal than you think by which I mean, you know, this covers everything. A- any tech CEO believes this right on down to, um, what's his name? The, 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 the you know, guy who hates God and stuff, uh, Richard Dawkins, he <laughs> believes, and he was a, a big pioneer of, of the meme and mimetic theory. And so a lot of these guys, pro- they don't really endorse this, but I don't see why they wouldn't because they talk about how an idea is like an organism, spreads like an organism. We talk about DNA. They'll say it has information, but what do you mean? Well, that means that it's like an idea. And this is where you kind of get into Schopenhauer too. And he's talking about how everything has a will. In different, maybe it's a semantic difference, but you know they're kind of talking about the same thing. That DNA is a, a code manifested as this thing that seeks to replicate, and so there is this synergy between the concept of information and the animating force behind things. And so when we now we're talking about how ideas spread like viruses or organisms, now we're talking about language as an entity and that's why i try and drill in people's heads like this isn't just arbitrary this isn't just superfluous stuff and we're not just playing around with abstract concepts you can imagine language as like an an entity almost with a will of its own and that's what was at the core of what i loved what anthropomorphics and like i said as i circled back as we waded into the waters of hard science there seemed to be this meshed so well onto that and i think a lot of people who dismiss it don't realize that now i kind of went off in a bunch of different directions there but what do you think about well that? yeah i mean it, it, it's you know um uh, it, it means that you know that, that it might it might be possible to to you know to go back to what in a sense is an older view of language as something more like uh um like magical incantations or or, or invocations or prayer uh trying to kind of elicit a response from what would then have been the deity, but now we're trying to elicit responses from the center, and the center, yeah, is where is where all of the all of the infrastructures, right, all of the technology ult- ultimately find their um, their their intersections, and um, and again, it's, I think it's a much more responsible way of 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 thinking about how we use language and how we speak and how we write. If you if you were to kind of think about um, what um, what you might be um, sort of bringing to life, in a sense, by saying one thing or another, then um, th- then then you you'd probably give a lot more thought to 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 saying that thing or, or or some other thing. And by now, yeah, we are in a sense all all plugged in to various networks. That if you understand the networks and you your um and and you 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 can follow the way in which language is um describing and inflecting and feeding back into the infrastructures well you can in a sense see yourself kind of operating directly on the you know on on the general intelligence so i i i i call it the central intelligence uh, um <laughs> uh you know which is yeah a little bit of a, a little bit of a pun because it refers to a you know to an organization that, that we all have our suspicions about of course See, now we want to become feds right well it, <laughs> you know in, cert- in a certain sense this is kind of a funny outcome of of, of of this suspicion of of uh of everybody being feds and you know um you know, there, there's a growing recognition um even among uh um Academics and especially in fields like uh, like media theory, of how deeply connected um, the federal government, government in particular, the intelligence agencies were with obviously things like the internet, um, which would you know, which is to say, and, and of course now everyone is conscious on all sides. I mean, it, it, it's become almost kind of caricature already, right? That uh, you know, any any political position you can almost kind of attribute to. Well, okay, that's this section. The, the, that that's this you know section within the FBI that's saying that. And this is that uh, faction within the CIA that's saying that. And and there's enough truth to it um, that you can kind of work with it. Um, but but then you know you get to the point and you you can you can kind of go in two directions. You can just get ultra suspicious of what everything says. You kind of enter this paranoid sphere, or 
Um, and, and in that case, then you get paranoid about what you're saying. Well, I mean, how do I know I'm not a Fed, right? I mean, yeah, I know I haven't had, you know, I haven't had any direct contacts with any of these guys, but but still my thinking is being influenced by this guy. And well, what do I know about this guy? And, and, and so on. So indirectly enough, at, at least we're all kind of, you know, you know, Fed-like, right? Well, but if that's the case then, um, well, I mean, in a certain sense, the only thing to do is go with it and, and feed back in to the intelligence. <laughs> network, which is depending upon us as well, right? The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, whoever it is at this point, who knows, um, they're, they're, they're not coming up with all this stuff on their own. They don't have some like deep language laboratory where they decide what, uh, you know, what, what, what everyone else should say. They're, they're just kind of getting in, in, into the flow. They have to be else they could, they, they do with this, you know, okay, well this, you know, um, this, this thing seems to be taking off. Let's see what we can do with that or whatever. So, so, you know, you're influencing them the same way they're influencing you. So, so the thing to do is to, is to, you know, and, and the more you can do it institutionally, whatever form companies form, form knowledge and media making companies. So, so, so that you're kind of, you know, you've got, you're getting access to data and you're getting access to information. And so then the CIA and whoever has to pay attention to you, um, and you're, and you're, and, and, you know, you're, you're contributing to the central intelligence as well. I think, you know, ultimately we, you know, that, that is the implication of what we've been saying the last, you know, whatever half hour or so about, uh, about the way in which, you know, all, all of this links into global networks and global infrastructures and so on where, you know, we can't really go back to saying, well, I have my opinion, the other guy has his opinion and some other person has their opinion and well, let's debate it out and see who we voted to office to implement our opinions. We all know that that doesn't really work that way anymore. If it ever did, I mean, it never really did, but at least it's, it seemed more plausible at an earlier point but now you're, you're entering networks in a particular way and, and so and you're participating in designing the infrastructure designing the scene in in uh um, in different ways and so you should know you're doing that right you shouldn't be deluding yourself that you know i'm just a guy with an opinion i'm trying to win over others to my opinion and, and so on I, I love that outline of it. Of it, it, we have to make people, and you touched on this before with the literacy, but also forcing people to change how they think they're interacting with the center and change their conceptualization of information. And we kind of touched on this in information theory, but you're talking about it in a much more practical way, like really pay attention. It's not really debate. It's not like you know we talk about democracy and everything, but the very way ideas propagate has changed the very way people are convinced of things has changed and that the very nature of the center we are gathered around has changed and i think you know this is where it's kind of start hitting their heads against the wall and wonder why what they're doing isn't working but because the entire net we use the term networks i think that's a very important way to look at it and the, the pe people are get frustrated because they don't understand how to even communicate and exist in this current world and i think i think this is a, a key to letting them figure it out and thinking about like how what is an idea what is a thought and how do they propagate and how are they communicated and maybe there's different practical ways we could actually make the world a better place and that's what i once again i like so much about this model and you know i think you know um thinking in terms of institutions of deferral we know we never really touched on on that, you know, that basic definition of, of language that goes, you know, that, that's Gans's definition of language. It's representation is the deferral of violence. And this notion of deferral becomes, I think, more and more important because um, we're, we're, we're always, you know, we're always deferring um, possible violence, right? And if you think about language that way, we're doing things, but with the things that we're doing are also a form of deferral. We're building institutions, all the, the institutions that we build are a way of preventing us from coming into some kind of direct confrontation that will just destroy everything. Um, and if you think about this kind of, then, then you then you kind of really have a long-term, you know, civilizational view of things, of institutions of, of deferral, and then you're kind of tending to the institutions of deferral, and you're making sure. And this and this is why also you know you 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 kind of have a basis for being strict where 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 people might feel you're being too you know you're being too strict right what do you care about a little dysfunction here or there right they, you know people have problems let them act out or whatever right don't you know well you know 
why if someone just paints graffiti on on, on the wall, well, you know, it's just some kid. He's you know he's expressing an artistic streak or or, or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, and this all sounds very plausible as long you know. Okay, if there's not too much crime and nothing else is really wrong, yeah, let you know, let the uh, you know, let let the, you know, let the kids you know do do his little you know spray painting on on the side of a building. Uh, but if you have this kind of longer view of 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 deferral, you know, of institutions of deferral, then again, I don't necessarily say you want to find every kind of tagger and put him in jail for twenty years or something like that. You know, there's a sense of proportion here, as well. But yeah. but you you have a basis for taking it seriously, right? And say, okay, you know, um, we we need a reason to allow this if we're, if we're going to allow this, and there might be good reasons for not allowing it even if you can't see negative consequences flowing directly from it because it because it erodes some some form of deferral that 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 we've built up and that and that um uh, has layers of of stability and solidity to it but if you take away one layer after another then 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 they can't be destroyed and and if you know that and you if you think with with those in terms then you then you really have a way of building you know a building for the future and and then i think this this guides your information gathering and dissemination practices as well right because you want to you know you want to gather information you want to gather intelligence that's relevant to the preservation and the enhancement and when necessary the creation of new institutions of deferral that's what you're gathering information and intelligence for that that's what you want to do and this really puts you Against some very powerful tendencies in the modern in, in the modern world, right? Which which go in exactly the opposite direction towards you know centrifugal relation to institutions, tearing them down, exploiting them, parasitizing them, and 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 so on. And th this gives you a way of thinking about how you're going against that and 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 securing the center, in a sense, right? Instead of seeing the center as something we can kind of you know kind of pinata. That we can keep, you know, bashing, and and you know, someone else will will come there, and we'll we'll celebrate them at the center for ten minutes, and then you know, they'll become a pinata that we smash, and and so on, and thinking that this is going to be perfectly fine. We're just kind of, you know, we're just letting out our our regression or, or whatever, and and uh, um, and and uh, we're, we're we're kind of in a simulated way settling our conflicts in this way. It's not it's not really settling the conflicts because because it just kind of inflames them. And it's exploiting the fact that we've built institutions that prevent us from devolving right into in, into civil violence and civil war, and so on. But but there's, there's no guarantee about any of this, and and uh, um, and it's really important. Uh, again, I you know the only po politics that 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 I think would be worthwhile is one that you know is interested in seeing people at the center that. Wherever the center is, right? However, we define that in terms of states or whatever that might look like, people who are at the center, which is to say, people who are issuing commands, we could put it this way: who um, who can stay there for a while, who can see the results of their commands, who could follow up on them, and and uh, um, and who can gather and have the kind of information and the kind of networks that they need to enforce uh, and 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 kind of track. The outcome of those of those uh, of those commands. So that's you know that's where thinking in terms of deferral again I think ties a lot of this stuff together. That's a great point. And um, just based on that, like we talk about, you had mentioned uh, just killing and smashing someone at the center. And you had mentioned previously about how the people on let's call them the left conceptualize this is that you know the society we're living now is I, I think of Huey Long. You know, I think he, he's kind of popular in this scene now and him, the Kingfisher and saying that every man a king and the and perhaps we could say this is an outgrowth, just natural outgrowth of liberalism, which this might get me in trouble. Bit of an outgrowth of Christianity, like we discussed before, the idea of everyone kind of being the center, everyone. We don't have someone at the center. Everyone's at the center. And how do we know that? Because every so often we put someone in the center and we destroy them all together. And then we well, just do that every five minutes, like you said. Yeah, and of course that's the reality of, of, of you know, of Girard's scapegoating mechanism, which of course one couldn't deny 
the reality of it, right? And Gans doesn't, and I, and I certainly don't. Obviously, we see that happen, and, and, and we see that happen very systematically. You can get to the point where you can kind of predict it, and, and you know, popular culture is kind of based on, on that, you know, and you know, most movies have, you know, some bad guy who essentially functions as a scapegoat. We, you know, we root for, for the bad guy to be, you know, to be killed and tortured and whatever is going to happen. So, um, yes, and, 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 uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, this follows from the notion that someone who's at the center is there at the sufferance of some entity, which you're going to call the people. Or, or whatever you're gonna, whatever you're gonna call that entity, um, and you know, again, we know enough about all this now to be able to say, well, there really is no people. There are, you know, there are institutions that that kind of construct versions of the people for various purposes and mobilize and enlist and constrict and conscript, you know, various uh, portions. Of the people for various purposes, and say this is the the, the people, um, and um, and this of course then you know becomes a real problem of agency. And by the way, one of the questions you wanted to talk about was that notion of the big scenic imaginary, and what the implications of that are now. Well, this is really this is really what I was trying to get at. What I am trying to get at with that notion of the big scenic imaginary. So you don't get into these these what I think are very kind of um, uh, inaccurate, and therefore unhelpful ways of speaking about things like, you know, the people are now rising up against so-and-so, right? Um, no, nothing like that is ever happening, right? What's happening again is, is, is this institution, at, you know, with this level of functionality is mobilizing these resources at its disposal to, to perform some function in some relation to these other institutions and so on. And the more, and the more we speak at that level of, 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 of how these and then you have scenes. Then you have scenes at that higher level, but they're not scenes that everybody's kind of directly on. They're they're scenes where you know this state is on a scene. The leader of this state is on the scene with the leader of this state, and, and various leaders of, of 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 you know internationally linked groups are are on the scene as well. And they're and they're all kind of addressing each other in various ways. And we're to some extent spectators. We see some of it. We don't see all of it. Um, and we're still talking about a scene. They still have to be on a scene. They still have to communicate with each other, engage with each other. They still have rivalries with each other and, and, and all of that. But that's, you know, that's the, the way I think we should learn to describe what's going on rather than in terms of, well, this group is getting tired of this group. And so now they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're kind of taking, you know, now taking revenge for what this group did against them and, 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 and so on. And, and and just again, these are kind of imaginary um, agencies that that don't really exist. I think that is as good a place to end as any, because that's exactly what I like for people to leave these sorts of shows with, with something that makes it real for them and practical for them, and gives them something to perhaps go out in the world with and take action on. Mr. Cat slash Bouvard, this has been a fantastic talk with you today. And before we go, I wanted to uh, plug a couple of things for you. Uh, first of all, if anyone has liked what they had heard today, uh, there's a lot more to dive into. There's a lot more deeper discussions to have on this topic. I would recommend checking out the Substack at Dennis Bouvard. That's D E N N I S B O U V A R D dot substack dot com. It's updated regularly. There's, there's several articles that dive into all the political and uh, existential applications of this. Uh, Mr. Gatz, is there anything else you would like to uh, bring attention to? No, no. I, I'll just. I just want to thank you. I, I, I enjoyed the discussion a lot, and, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity always to talk about the originary hypothesis and GA. Do not let the rapists win. Listen and love Blood Satellite.